Good evening, everybody. My name is William Weitzer, and I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute. On behalf of LBI's president, Dr. Ronald Sobel, and myself, I'd like to welcome you to the Center for Jewish History. LBI shares this beautiful complex with four other partners, the American Jewish Historical Society, American Sephardi Federation, Yeshiva University Museum, and, and the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Together, we hold the largest and most comprehensive archive of Jewish history outside of Israel. We serve scholars, genealogists, students, and their teachers, and the general public. Tonight's glorious event could not have happened without the advice and support of Dr. Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel and Ambassador Carl Spielvogel. They have guided the Center and LBI in discussions that resulted in the creation of the Diamondstein Spielvogel Forum on History and the Public Good. Barbara Lee and Carl, I thank you for your inspiration and support. I would now like to call on Dr. Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel for a few words. On behalf of Carl Spielvogel and myself, a very warm welcome to each and all of you. Thank you for joining us here this evening. While we inaugurate a new series, History and the Public Good, we could think of no one finer or more thoughtful as a speaker than Bill Moyers to begin this series. It was created to provide a forum where distinguished public intellectuals reflect on the ways that a deeper understanding of and engagement with history is essential for the struggle for a more perfect society. The person who inspired us to create this series, Dr. Ronald Sobel, a really wonderful man, as many of you know, is a deeply compassionate, judicious leader who reaches beyond denominations, heals divisions, and unites people in their common humanity. He's brought his activism to positions in the ADL, the New York Civil Rights Coalition, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and tonight's hosts, the Center for Jewish History and the Leo Beck Institute, of which he is president. During his four-decade career as a senior rabbi at Temple Emanuel, the largest Jewish reform congregation in the world, and he was the youngest person ever to achieve that role. He preached at the houses of worship of many different denominations, looking beyond our professed faith to our shared experiences. This includes an ambitious effort to unite Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, and Muslim clergy, resulting in the citywide coalition, a partnership of faith. Dr. Sobel believes that the strength of a community is measured not only in its internal bonds, but in its relations with others. That it is every individual's responsibility to try to bring positive change to the world and to seek our own answers to the difficult questions posed to each of us. He believes a better future is possible only through engagement with the past, even where it is most painful. He is an inspiration and a role model for us all. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Ronald B. Sobel. That hug and kiss was with Barbara Lee's permission. 
And Carl, we're living in an age where I didn't even have to turn to you and say, may I? <laughs> and thank God for it. <clears throat> I am somewhat embarrassed by, deeply grateful to, and genuinely proud of my long friendship with Ambassador and Mrs. Carl Spielbogel, both of whom are remarkably gifted people. Barbara Lee and Carl, each in their own way, has made significant contributions to our city, our state, our nation. I cherish their friendship, and among the multitude of memories, I clearly recall the hour when, 37 years ago on October the 27th, 1981, Barbara Lee and Carl created themselves as a family, and I was privileged to be present to officiate at their wedding hour. Happy anniversary, Barbara Lee and Carl. <clears throat> that the two of them have chosen to establish this lecture in my honor here. Within the venue of the Leo Beck Institute is particularly gratifying. Founded in the mid-1950s in the Jerusalem apartment of Martin Buber, the Institute has become and continues to grow as the largest archive and research center documenting the history and culture of German-speaking Jewry spanning a period of 1,700 years of history. We now turn to the reason for our being here this evening. Not to hear me, but to sit at the foot of Bill Moyers, absorbing his wisdom. His is a wisdom deep, wide-ranging, and profound. And within the internal world of that wisdom is a humble man. That humility was expressed to our executive director, Dr. Weitzer, when he said, I hope that the introduction will take no more than a minute. <laughs> Truly great people do not need long introductions. The lives of truly great people speak eloquently for themselves. And so now, Bill, I will do the very best I can <laughs> to keep to your request for a minute of introduction. And those of you who might have a second hand on your watch, try me, test me, and when I say go, that will be the time that the minute begins. I may go a little bit over, but I don't think very much. <laughs> go. <laughs> to teach minds and touch hearts through the instrumentalities of the press and television and his many authored books. To do so consistently and brilliantly for the better part of five decades speaking truth to power while giving voice to the voiceless, all the while with impeccable integrity, authentic scholarly research, and inquiring curiosity, a rare and wondrous gift to America and to the world. His theme, history, memory, and democracy Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Moyers. 
Theo, did I do it? Did I do it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that welcome, and thank you, Dr. Sobel, for that very short introduction. It isn't really that only truly modest people don't want long introductions. What's true is that truly long-winded journalists don't want a minute stolen out of their hour lecture. <laughs> I was a broadcast journalist so long that I became accustomed to MCs. Uh, masters of ceremony who would say he needs no introduction. And that was true in some circles, but after I retired my weekly broadcast series, I was sitting one day in Union Station in Washington, uh, waiting for the train, and a lady about my age, a little younger than uh, me, uh, came up with a quizzical look on her face and said, aren't you Bill Moyers? And I said, once upon a time, I, I was. <laughs> well, I'll be darned, she said. I didn't think you were still with us. <laughs> well, here I am, I said. Uh, and she still looked puzzled, figuring her to be uh, a news junkie. I said, perhaps you've confused me with some other on-air journalists like David Brinkley or Paul Duke or Howard K. Smith or Charles Carroll, any of those colleagues at CBS or PBS are in the medium at large. Uh, all of them have recently passed on, I said. She wasn't satisfied, and as she turned to walk away, she said over her shoulder, well, I always watched you when you were alive. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here tonight, alive, more or less. Obviously, the side effects of a long life are catching up with me. But I assure you, there is no place tonight I would rather be than here among so many kindred spirits. Uh, Barbara Lee and Carl, I have you to thank for this. I was very pleased to hear that you had launched this series, uh, and then I was flabbergasted to receive your invitation uh, to kick it off. I never thought over our long friendship that you would be so reckless uh, as to risk your reputation on a journalist, the enemy of the people, uh, especially uh, for a lecture on history, memory, and democracy, because as that old curmudgeon George uh, Bernard Shaw said, journalists cannot tell the difference between a bicycle accident and the collapse of civilization. <laughs> well, this is no collapse, uh, this is no bicycle accident we're dealing with now, but uh, there is a difference. Your devoted friend Judith couldn't be here uh, tonight. As you and Carl know, she came home last night from uh, knee surgery. She's disappointed, of course, although her recovery is likened, likely to be hastened by not having to listen uh, to me tonight. You two have been such wonderful friends. The camaraderie that we have shared together has been one of the joys of our time in New York. Barbara and I go back a long time to when Democrats were Democrats and, uh, and, uh, and things got done in Washington, but we've also kept up that friendship and that relationship in New York. She and Carl have done so much for the arts, for architecture, for preservation, for public policy, uh, and particularly her role with the Historic uh, Preservation Committee has made a difference in this city. And I'm so glad to see tonight uh, the company you keep, other people who are here. Thank you for making this possible, and thank you for including me in it. I'm honored to be speaking at the Leo Beck Institute to meet Dr. Sobel again after so many years, and Dr. Weitzer, Billy Weitzer, we share the same name. My mother named me Billy. His mother must have named him uh, William, but he changed, changed it to Billy. I changed mine to Bill when, I, at 16, I went to work for the newspaper in the home, my hometown because Billy didn't fit into the uh, byline area, so <laughs> I wasn't going to lose that. I'm also so uh, glad to, to, to see... Uh, Ismar Shorts here uh, tonight. 
He was chancellor of the Jewish Theological uh, Seminary 30 years ago when I was invited to accept an honorary doctorate there. He deservedly then and now deserves a, a reputation far and wide as a top scholar in modern Jewish history, a leading spokesman on so many, uh, so such a large range of issues. We met earlier when he starred starred, really starred, with the Dalai Lama in a PBS special that Judith and I produced called Spirit and Nature, which was an exploration of religion, ethics, and the environment, and I became a fan. If you have not had the time so far to read the commencement speech that uh, Ismar delivered at the Jewish Theological Seminary in 2006, this was after my appearance there, I urge you to do so. It's brilliant. My copy is dog-eared now because I have consulted it several times over the years since I heard about it and got a copy of it and have it in my research folder. Because what he says uh, for, about, democracy, about religion is just as true for democracy. And as some of you know, those two have been my main interest in my long career in journalism. He speaks of the ancient tradition of Jewish spirituality that was, quote, never estranged from the life of the mind. And he laments the tendency to mindlessly look for a quick spiritual fix. This line I remember distinctly. Faith once moved us to study our heritage deeply, while truth asks of us that we do it critically in light of all we know. Strong faith honors truth, and true democracy learns from it. What an impressive work is being done here at the Leo Beck Institute. May I say to Dr. Sobel, to Billy Weitzer, and all the trustees and staff that your mission at the intersection of the past and the present of history and memory is crucial to understanding the Jewish experience and to bolstering bolstering the foundations of democracy at this time. My close friend and the longtime senior minister at Riverside uh, Church, where Judith and I attend, came up to me at a reception not long ago and said, Bill, I, I want to ask you a question. I said, what is it? He says, what do we answer when democracy cries, I can't speak, I can't breathe, I can't speak, I can't breathe. What do we say when democracy cries as it cries today, I can't breathe? I hope to address that as a journalist in the time we have together and especially in our question and answer period. I spent uh, four Sunday afternoons in August on the Institute's website, particularly on project, I think you call it Proc, Proc, Proc Kef, uh, 1938, 1938 project, I, I, I call it in, in Texas. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I went just to check it out because Billy had told me what was happening there and I stayed for three or four hours that first Sunday afternoon and then every Sunday afternoon after that in in August, I went back because when you go to this website, it's, it's really demonstrating uh, how history now has changed for our access to it. When you go to this site, you go from one dimension to another. You become your own guide, your own navigator, and you see something here about what happened on a Sunday in 1938 and in, in, in Vienna to a particular Jewish man, woman, or child, and then you want to go and see where they came from and where they went. And you find yourself getting deeply immersed in the lives of people with names and faces, almost people with whom you can talk online, even though they are long gone. And I found myself excavating my ignorance about that time in a very refreshing and invigorating way. And I just want to say I've seen the future in looking at the past through 1938 Project, and I salute you for leading the way in introducing us 
to a new and powerful venue for coming to terms with the, our ignorance about the past. The stories I found there are stories of individuals, men, women, and children, as I said, whose personal stories vivify the watershed year of 1938, when their hopes for the future and the future of Germany's democracy perished with the Anschluss and Kristallnacht. Some, you can realize in visiting the site, since the coming terror. One of the most moving posts that I read was a simple bill, an invoice to the dentist Max Isidore Mall and his wife Etta, the textile worker, 800 Reichmarks, Reichmarks for shipping 11 boxes of household effects from Vienna to Hamburg to the United States, where they expected in time to catch up with them once they got their visa from the American consulate in Vienna. And who could not be moved by the entry of a Hamburg lawyer named Wilhelm Hesse, who kept diaries for his young daughters, Helen and Eva? We're immigrating, he wrote in deep black ink. That's the theme, he said, of Rosh Hashanah this year. We are immigrating. Then I read the post from the once celebrated opera and concert singer Amelia Canary, a widow, writing to the elder of her two sons who had already fled to the United States, informing them that she must sell their family house and possessions at a price below value. That's all it said for that moment. And I just sat there trying to put myself into the mind and the experience of that widow being forced by the Germans to flee from the home they owned and to sell it at a loss far below the value of their lives there. And then there was the October 1938 notice from the Berlin Reich Physicians Chamber instructing physicians that the dimensions of the triangles of the Star of David on their office sign with a blue sky background and a lemon color should be 3.2 centimeters, and that they will no longer be called doctors, but caregivers of the sick. Such power over the lives of individuals. Of course, many in Germany at that time could not imagine the coming nightmares. Surely the Nazis would not long remain in power. Sanity prevail. The shocks pass, and life return to normal. Surely they and their country would survive. We have a rich culture, a great history. We're at home in this democracy. Nothing awful is really going to happen. And they stayed. The first afternoon I spent on the project, I kept pausing to consider that in 1938, I was just four years old. We had moved from Oklahoma to Texas after the Great Depression forced my parents to leave the tenant farm they had been working. My mother was uh, 24, my father was 25, and they had to leave the farm because it had failed and they had no more work to do and therefore they had to vacate the house. I would grow up in East Texas poor, but pleasantly, in a small frame house with a swing on the front porch, safely playing chase in the front yard, shooting marbles, snaring lightning bulbs, eavesdropping on the grown-ups in the swing on the front porch, wholly unaware that on this same planet, on the very earth on which I stood, there were children my age being assaulted, shattered, hounded, murdered, and buried in pits covered with lime. In this country, the government in Washington was trying to help my family get back on its feet. My father got a job for a dollar a day 
helping to build a highway from Dallas to Oklahoma City. And he thought that was a miracle. The government had stepped in. In Europe, entire families were being targeted by their government for extermination and deportation. How could such a fate have been thinkable to my friends in Marshall, Texas, giggling and spinning the bottle on a warm summer evening? So to go back through project, to the 1938 project, is to not only encounter the lives of people with names and faces I would never know except for what you're doing here to recreate their experience, but it is also to realize just how precarious our own existence might be when the sheer lust for power, when ruthless cruelty and contempt for the law take hold of a nation's life and arteries. The past, even the past only 80 years ago, and, I've, and I'm 84, the past of when I was four years old, even that past confronts us with this stark reality that too many in Germany in 1938 could not grasp. It is this, civilization is but a thin line of civility stretched across the passions of the human heart. We can never take it for granted. So Billy Weitzer says, this history must be remembered. And I congratulate you for making sure it will be remembered. Because as I read years ago when I was filming the first documentary I did in Israel, I read on the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum, in remembrance is the secret of redemption. In remembrance is the secret of redemption. So a, a confession. I'm not a historian. I'm not a scholar. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. I'm simply a journalist, a beachcomber on the shores of other people's knowledge and experience, licensed, so to speak, by the requirements of my craft to explain things I don't understand. <laughs> on occasions like this, I find it useful to experience, to remember the experience of the writer and humorist Robert Benchley when he arrived to take the final examination at his class in international law at Harvard. He discovered that the test consisted of one assignment. Quote, discuss the abstraction of the international fisheries problem in respect to hatcheries, dragnet, and protocol as it affects A, the point of view of Great Britain, and B, the point of view of the United States. Bitchy was desperate, but he was also honest and resolute, and he wrote, I know nothing about the point of view of Great Britain in the arbitration of the international fisheries problem, and nothing about the point of view of the United States. I shall therefore discuss the issue from the point of view of the fish. <laughs> that's, that's my point of view. A very small fish swimming now for a very long time in a very large pond. I wrestle with the consequences of my, the unintended consequences of my own calling. When the poet Czeslaw Milos accepted the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1980, he said, our planet that gets smaller every year with its fantastic proliferation of mass media is witnessing a process that escapes definition, characterized by a refusal to remember. That was well below, before social media. And I was struck upon reading those remarks that broadcast journalism, my field of choice, was part of that fantastic proliferation of mass media. 
media, still are, although this was well before social media. And we are contributing to making this an anxious age of agitated amnesiacs. Not a disaster happens in the world that we do not instantly hear of it. But rarely is there context for the endless procession of events that make up the news of the day. Or now the news on Google, Facebook, and Twitter of this moment. We seem to know everything about the last 24 hours, but very little about the last 60 years or the last 60 centuries. Back in the 80s, this troubled Judith and me. She was my co-producer, very much my equal partner in the creativity and editorial content of what we did, as well as being the business uh, agent for our company. Um, this troubled both of us. So for our benefit as much as for anyone else, we produced a series called A Walk Through the 20th Century. It ran on CBS cable. Yes, there was a CBS cable at the time, and on PBS. There were 20 episodes in all. The series opened with an episode entitled The Democrat and the Dictator, a kind of morality play, if you will, exploring li the lives of Franklin Roosevelt and Adolf, Adolf Hitler. They came to power within weeks of each other. They faced off in a global war, and they died in the same month. Roosevelt relished politics and learned early on that it requires both deals and ideals. He surrounded himself with a brain trust of thinkers and doers. Hitler thrived on force, gathered around him thugs and bullies, and gave scope to their paranoia, anger, and cruelty. Hitler loathed the arts purged museums of some 17,000 paintings, opened a Nazi gallery, and conditioned propaganda art. Roosevelt created a federal art project that kept starving artists alive and encouraged writers to write. And on the post office where I grew up in East Texas, there was a mural on the Roosevelt commissioned and built post office where I used to take our mail or go to get it. Both Roosevelt and Hitler had in common clear, unmistakable voices audible to the multitudes. Both used radio and film to magnify this power to communicate, one whipping his angry, defeated people into a frenzy of xenophobic nationalism. The other pressing his country to arm against the tyranny rising in Germany and Europe. To Hitler, the individual was only a small cell microscopic in the body politic. He expected young Germans to salute, click their heels, and obey. He always wanted an audience like Kim Jong had. Roosevelt told young Americans to go out and do something for others in the spirit of service, even join the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts, he said. And while Hitler's voice promised a thousand-year Reich, Roosevelt warned Americans that they could not live in a world half free and half slave. Hitler saw and felt the hatred and shame that gri gripped his people after Germany lost the First World War and he set out to use that defeat to create a single great audience that became the basis of a militant movement. He destroyed democracy in his country. Roosevelt sought to save it, proclaiming the four freedoms that would counter the great concentration of power and wealth threatening to crush democracy in America. Some of the most powerful and rich men in America fought Roosevelt. Not only did they detest his New Deal because it invoked and invade the government, 
but they actually saw fresh alternatives in Italy, Japan, and Germany for dealing with modern problems. Barron's, the weekly Bible of the financial establishment in this country, called for a mild species of dictatorship that will help us over the roughest roads, bumps in the road ahead. Republican Senator David Reed of Pennsylvania said, if a country ever needed a Mussolini, it needs one now. And Fred Koch, who spawned future billionaire brothers Charles and David, and therefore their empire, reckoned in 1938, the year on which you have focused, that the only sound countries in the world are Germany, Italy, and Japan. He especially admired Hitler's leadership. He was a strong man. And when you, this is a direct quote, when you contrast the state of mind of Germany today, 19, this was in 1938, with what it was in 1925, you begin to think that perhaps this course of idleness, feeding at the public trough, dependence on government, et cetera, with which we are afflicted, is not, per is not permanent and can be overcome. Yes, just like Hitler proved it could be with the Anschluss and Kristallnacht. Koch would later call Dwight Eisenhower a communist. He would also help create the John Birch Society, and his son Charles would join it. As the Center for Media and Center Media and Democracy has documented, Charles also spearheaded fundraising for the John Birch Society at the height of its attacks on the Reverend Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement as a purported communist conspiracy. Nice people. <laughs> we followed that episode in our series with a documentary on the propaganda battles of World War II. Propaganda is as old as the pageantry and sorcery by which ancient emperors wooed their subjects and awed them and as old as missionaries and the Declaration of Independence. But in the 20th century superstate, propaganda became a fateful means for a zealous few to manipulate millions. No sooner had he been made chancellor in 1933 than Adolf Hitler opened a new ministry called the People's Enlightenment and Propaganda and made Joseph Goebbels its head. No one practiced the black art of propaganda more effectively than the chief of Hitler's film ministry, Fritz Hippler. In 1982, we found him living in Berchtesgaden, healthy and unrepentant. He agreed to an interview and told our producer, David Grubin, on camera, how he tried to reach the soul of the masses, that's his turn, term, through appalling movies like The Eternal Jew that planted the seed for genocide. It was a chilling interview. And Fritz Hippler said, Hitler's only mistake was to lose the war. In this same episode, we included another portrait some of you real movie fans will remember, no doubt, the cocky little Sicilian immigrant, Fritz Capra. He was famed for gentle movies like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, touting ordinary folks and apple pie virtue. He was in his 90s when I interviewed him. When FDR wanted to counter Hitler's propaganda, he drafted, he drafted Frank Capra. Gave him a uniform. He came in the room here in New York where I interviewed him, carrying a portfolio of pictures under his arm. They were photographs taken as the war ended by American soldiers entering Dachau and Buchenwald. Frank Capra had kept them to remind him what had been at stake. They were his evidence that history not only mattered, it instructed. 
Oscar Morgenstern had a similar understanding of what history can show us. Morgenstern was the German-born economist who, in collaboration with a, math with a mathematician, John von Neumann, founded the field of game theory. He was a professor at the University in Vienna, but in 1938 was visiting in this country when Hitler's Anschluss swallowed Austria. Unable to return home, he stayed at Princeton the rest of his life until he died at the age of 77. In our research for this series, we discovered that he had made a proposal shortly before his death in which he proposed that all future meetings of the world statesmen should take place in one very specific setting, a bare, uncomfortable frame building in some unpleasant spot, hot in the summer, frigid in winter, furnished with one long table, a plain tablecloth, and straight wooden chairs. The high walls of the conference room would be covered with large photo murals depicting memorable scenes that would register the capability of human beings for violence and inhumane behavior. As they negotiated, the statesmen would be surrounded by blow-ups of the wretched trenches of Verdun and the Somme, where 1,100,000 men died in a single day. 1,100,000 in a single day. There would be pictures of the bodies piled at Bellew Wood and Chateau Terry, of the deep-eyed children kicked and battered in the Warsaw Ghetto being shipped to the gas chambers, of the SS using makeshift nooses of piano wire to hang boys and girls in rural Portland, Poland, of the dead at Iwo Jima and Dresden and Hiroshima, of prisoners bayoneted beyond cheering crowds in the soccer stadium during the India-Pakistani War, of Solon's gulags and Pol Pot's death squads, of John Kennedy's blood-soaked limousine, Robert Kennedy lying on the ground on the hotel kitchen floor, Martin Luther King shot down on a Memphis balcony, of a boy dying on the sidewalk at Kent State University, of a little girl in, Vien in, in, in Vietnam running naked down the road, burning with napalm, of Armenians simply disappeared of unmarked and unnumbered graves, numbered graves the world over. Had he left, lived, Morgenstern could have kept plastering photographs all over that hypothetical conference room with photos of more and more atrocities. Because as Zadie Smith writes just recently, only the willfully blind can ignore that the history of human existence is simultaneously the history of pain of brutality, murder, mass extension, every form of venality and cyclical horror. No land is free of it, she said. No people are without their bloodstain, no tribe entirely innocent. And had he lived, Morgan Stern would certainly have seen that in that hypothetical hall, photographs of the lynching tree and the bodies of the men and women murdered on those lynching trees would also appear. After my father's death, I found in the lower desk drawer of his bedroom a picture of the Paris News in 1905. My father was only born in 1904, so he couldn't have been at what the picture was, but it had left an impact on him probably because either his father or his grandfather was there. It was a photograph on the front page of the paper of a man who'd been lynched the day before. Some three to 4,000 people were gathered there, many of them laughing, cheering, smiling into the primitive cameras. My father had kept that newspaper all of his life, and I never had the chance to ask him why. No land is free of it. No people are without their blood stain. No tribe entirely innocent. You have likely noticed that since the 2016 election, George Orwell's novel, 1984, has reappeared on the best-selling list. I imagine some of you have helped to put it there. You'll remember in it that Big Brother, the state, banishes history to the memory hole 
where inconvenient facts simply disappear. Despotism, as Orwell sees it, relies on the police power of government for enforcement, but it rests on the obliteration of the past. O'Brien, the personification of Big Brother, says to the protagonist Winston Smith, we shall squeeze you empty, and then we shall fill you with ourselves. People are made to remember only what they are taught to remember, and their content of the memory is changed overnight, today over one news cycle. The bureaucrats in the Ministry of Truth, obviously a precursor of Fox News, destroy the records and publish new versions. These, in turn, are superseded by yet more revisions until history becomes one long erasure. Well, why do you go to such lengths to wipe out memory? Because people without memory who cannot recall the last lie, the last 100 lies, the last 1,000 lies are at the mercy of authoritarian rulers because they have nothing against which to measure what they are told today. At the last rally, the last press conference, the last brainwashing, or the last tweet. Like all strong men seeking absolute power, Adolf Hitler needed his own selective version of the past to give emotional force to his vision. He needed a big lie. He found it in Germany's state of mind. Since losing World War I, Germans had walked around in something of a daze, asking each other, why did we lose? Were we that weak? There was an existential crisis in the German psyche. Then along comes this powerful, charismatic, spellbinding demagogue who says, you didn't lose the war. You weren't weak. Germany was stabbed in the back, betrayed by Jews, Marxists, and liberals who undermined our traditional German values. Real Germans, he told them, are strong and good, and you are real Germans. Your leaders betrayed you, and it worked. Here are the actual words from the translation of a speech Hitler made in February of 1940. Quote, only inferior personalities were at the helm at that time. Sound familiar? The German people had nothing to do with their failure. If at that time I, as the representative of a new political idea, appeared in this hall, I did so as representative of those millions of individual Germans who had not broken down like the old parties and the old political forms. The German people themselves, he said, had to be raised to become the guardians of their Reich. We had to create a state of affairs under which we would be able to mobilize this strength. And then this to the German people. Quote, nationalism and socialism had to be redefined and they had to be blended into one strong new idea to carry new strength, which would machen Deutschland weit and grob, make Germany great again. Oh, the memes that lurk in our DNA. But here's the point. Reinvent history, create a new myth from it, throw in a big lie. It could be a birth of lie. And presto, the people remember of their greatness only what you told them was great. And in so 
doing. You turn their memory into the slave of your ambition. No, I don't think Donald Trump is Adolf Hitler. I don't think that Trumpism is Nazism. And I don't think we are the Weimar Republic. I think I agree with the Harvard legal scholar Cass Sunstein when he says that our system of checks and balances in the Constitution will keep us from sliding into the abyss that was Nazi Germany. But I tell you that when I spent those four afternoons on that website, your website, looking at 1938 Project, for the first time in my life, I began to sense what it might have been to live in Italy as Mussolini rose to power, or Putin in Russia, Pinochet in Chile, Erdogan in Turkey, Chavez in Venezuela, and now Bolsonaro in Brazil, the far-right candidate whose success, reports the New York Times, has defied the laws of political gravity. Quote, until recently, Mr. Bolsonaro was a provocateur on the fringes of power who accomplished little as a seven-term lawmaker, but made headlines by calling for a military dictatorship and verbally attacking women, gays, and people of color in a country that is mostly non-white. He called women ignorant. To a female lawmaker, she was too ugly to rape. And he has questioned why women should earn the same salary as men. Straight talk, I'm still quoting the Times, from a man who is not afraid to say and do what is needed. Once I would have read that story as a journalist and as an American, as a journalist as a matter of professional curiosity, as an American to say, hey, God, what kind of country is that? Now I find myself wondering, would I be worrying about Bolsonaro's appointments to Brazil's Supreme Court? And I can understand why my longtime friend and colleague, Michael Winship, who is here tonight, came back from Germany early this week, metaphorically ashen-faced, I might say, at what he had seen at the Topography of Terror Documentation Center in Berlin. That's the museum which documents the rise of Hitler in the Third Reich and the unspeakable crimes against humanity committed in their names. Folk right now, it's sponsoring an exhibit called Berlin 1933, the path to dictatorship, four years before, five years before your year, 1938. Michael wrote a column about what he saw there. What he saw were the all too familiar seeds, in his words, of a nascent totalitarian regime, which is what authoritarian regimes are, should the seeds sprout. First, now this is Germany, 1933. First, the denigration and condemnation of rival political parties. Second, the disintegration of the courts. Third, attacks on organized labor while claiming massive job creation. Fourth, the dismissal of public servants unwilling to swear undying allegiance to the leader. Fifth, verbal and written slurs and smears against the press and opponents. And sixth, inciting and legitimating violence against anyone who dares to disagree. What was it? Your president said in Montana the other day, this guy who did the body slam, he's my guy. And the crowd cheered. These came to fruition in Germany in 1933 
By the following years, year, Hitler's cult of personality, according to the acclaimed biographer Ian Kershaw, had reached new levels of idolatry and made millions of new converts. Disdain and detestation for a parliamentary system generally perceived to have failed miserably had resulted in the willingness to entrust monopoly control over the state to a leader claiming a unique sense of mission and invested by his mass following with heroic, almost messianic qualities. Conventional forms of government were, as a consequence, increasingly exposed to the arbitrary inroads of personalized power. It was a recipe for disaster. And Michael adds this footnote. To those who still claim it odious or unjust to compare our current White House and the Republican Party to what happened in Germany 85 years ago, I would urge them to come see Berlin 1933. You do not have to goose step on democracy to destroy it. Just pull the rug out from under it. Ask Mitch McConnell. So, I've got another minute. Thank you. <laughs> so what is it we want to remember about democracy? That it's better than tyranny, easier to be applauded than practiced, and like any great ship that has weathered many storms at sea, may sink through the mutiny of those on board. In this past summer of the American scholar, the historian John Lucas concludes that the modern age, the great age of the past 500 years, is over. The chief feature of that age, he writes, was the rise of democracy, defined by Lucas as the role of majorities instead of minorities. When Henry Miller, by the way, was asked to define democracy, he answered, well, in short, the blind leading the blind. And I'm beginning to think that makes sense. Although the word existed in ancient Greece, in the past 2,000 years, Democracy has been put into practice for only very short episodes. When the brilliant young Frenchman de Tocqueville, French statesman and philosopher, famously toured the nascent United States in the 1830s, what he saw happening here, as Lucas tells it, was even more important than the French Revolution, maybe even more important than the Enlightenment, because, he said, it engaged people beyond politics. And that is so true. Democracy is not just about politics, but politics can undermine, subvert, and destroy democracy. If Lucas is right, Tocqueville believed the great movement of history was the transformation from an aristocratic to a democratic age. It was monumental and irreversible. Monumental, yes. Irreversible, not likely. If only Tocqueville had come to America just 10 years earlier, he could have debated democracy's longevity with uh, John Adams in what would surely have been one of the great conversations of that era. Adams was a student of history, particularly the history of tragedy. He understood that what has been gained can just as easily be lost. In a letter to his wife, Abigail, he pressed her to remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There never was a democracy that did not commit suicide. 
<laughs> he even reckoned the average age of democracy at 250 years. So let me hit the pause button here. <laughs> uh, it's the Constitution was ratified on Monday, September the 17th, 1789. Where does that put us tonight on John Adams' timeline? Who will do the math? Okay, I'll do the math. That's 231 years and counting. John Adams' timeline doesn't seem so abstract now, does it? But why was he pessimistic about the future of this great experiment that he was helping to launch a new nation in the wilderness, raising up the hopes of the world, our founding fathers said? Why be so pessimistic about a flight to the moon? before you're off the launching pad. Because he understood human nature, including his own. He was too honest not to know democracy wasn't all that secure, even in his hands. Case in point, John Adams was notoriously thin-skinned. One Vermont congressman described him as swallowed up in a continual grasp for power, in an unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and selfish avarice. In 1798, supposedly to safeguard the country against the coming war with France, Adams and his Federalist Party enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts, Acts, which enabled the government, among other things, to deport immigrants and make it harder for naturalized citizens to vote. Such memes in our DNA. But as Ronald Schaefer wrote recently in the Washington Post, the law was mainly designed to silence backers of the opposition party led by Thomas Jefferson. Adams and his partisans were trying to take down a critic and a rival. One target of the new law was that Vermont congressman who had accused him of ridiculous pomp. Another was Benjamin Franklin's grandson, a newspaper editor, who described the president as old, querulous, bald, blind, crippled, and toothless, as well as a real estate deal. I, I'm sorry, take that. <laughs> that, was, that was even too much for Abigail, who urged her husband to do something, do something to stop these wicked and base, violent attacks against him and his government. Well, John didn't need much coaxing. On the desk right in front of him was the Alien and Sedition Act, which made it illegal, quote, to write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the executive branch and the president. I can see him in my mind's eye reaching over with his pen and signing it. With that act, of course, he inflicted a blow to the democratic principle that public officials be held accountable to the people in the exercise of power. As you know, the act was later nullified. His own shortcomings notwithstanding, Adams actually told us more specifically why he thought democracy as likely as aristocracy and monarchy to go into the dustbin of history. He understood, and I'm quoting him now, that democracy is no less vain, no less proud, no less selfish, no less ambitious, and no less avaricious as they are. Such passions, said our second president, are the same in all men under all forms of government, and when unchecked, produce the same effects of fraud, violence, and cruelty. When clear prospects are open, he said, before vanity, pride, avarice, or ambition for their easy gratification, it is hard for the most considerate philosophers and the most conscientious moralists to resist the temptation. Individuals have conquered themselves, nations, and large bodies of men never. If you have time, for only one book between now and the midterm elections. I have the one for you. Ben Fountain's Beautiful Country, Burn Again. 
It's the boldest, bravest, and most bracing book about politics that I have read this year. You may know Ben Fountain from his fiction. Both his novel, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award, and his collection of short stories, Brief Encounters with Che Guevara, were bestsellers. In 2016, The Guardian asked him to do something he had never done, cover the presidential election. So from the roadkill express of the Iowa caucus to the spectacle of Donald Trump's inauguration, he tracked this strange mutation of American politics that surely has George Orwell turning in his grave and our founding fathers wishing for a second chance. Here, says Ben Fountain, was a candidate who proffered family values at every turn, yet was twice divorced, a tabloid fodder, serial adulterer, and a sexual trash talker. The least racist person you'll ever meet, by his own account, even as he punctuated the campaign with racist appeals so large and so livid that neo-Nazis, the KKK, and the alt-right endorsed him with a language evocative of the second coming. How did this very embodiment of Sodom and Gomorrah, this coarse, cruel, showboating mogul from the seamy real estate world of New York become the darling of the Bible Belt and the hero of the heartland? Why? How? Because he was the perfect demagogue at the perfect time. Demagogues may be phony, but the problems they exploit ride out of a sense of shared grievance among ordinary people against governments they think are hostile to their needs. Many years before Trump, while he was still stamping his name on country clubs and firing people on The Apprentice, the prominent economist Robert Reich described the perfect storm that has threatened our democracy for years now an unprecedented concentration of income and wealth at the top, a record amount of secret money flooding the system, and a public becoming increasingly angry and cynical. When Trump rode into town, it was ripe for plucking. Millions of Americans still believe the dogma of democracy on some superficial public level but they no longer believed it privately because democracy had stopped working for them. Then there was, of course, race. I'm a little over time. I'll stop in just a minute. We'll come back tomorrow night. <laughs> but on my birthday, June 5th, 1934, Germany's top lawyers gathered to begin drafting the Nuremberg Laws. Those laws would, in, when they were enacted the next year, diminish Jews to the lowest class of citizenship. They would make it possible to prevent people of color from ever becoming a member of the government of Germany. And they took care of several other things. But what was most interesting to me as I looked at this story was that the Germans began on June 5th, 1934, my birthday, to discuss the Nuremberg Laws by spending most of their time looking at American laws. They were fascinated and impressed with the Jim Crow laws of the South. They admired greatly America's immigration law of 1924 because it had kept people of color from coming into this country. And of course, Adam, Adolf Hitler had been mesmerized about how Americans had conquered the West 
He said we should do it with the Jews the way they did it with the Reds. The Americans have shown us how. And would you believe that some of the lawyers in those sessions that went on day after day thought that America's laws dealing with segregation, coerced segregation, that America's laws were too harsh for the Germans? It was incredible. But they spent a lot of time exploring and borrowing from Jim Crow. Now, I tell that story because I grew up in Texas under Jim Crow laws. The laws under which I lived were admired by the Germans, by the Nazis, as they set out to write the Nuremberg Law. I grew up in a town of 10,000 blacks and 10,000 whites, and never the twain met. And it didn't hit me for many years how you can be well-loved, well-churched, and well-taught and know nothing about the people who live a few blocks from your home. And it makes easy the treatment of the Jew, the black, the woman, the native, anyone you want to marginalize. It makes easy their dispatchment, their humiliation, and their extermination. And those were those embraced in Germany, the laws of America. That was waiting for Donald Trump. White folks eager to get it back. They had lost something, their place, their primacy, their stature. They wanted it back. Ben Fountain writes, we could vote, hold marches, post our views on Facebook and Twitter, join movements, sign petitions, support this or that candidate. It hardly mattered. Something had gone wrong with American democracy, or rather what was happening only looks like democracy, but was in fact something different. Different Indeed, democracy became a privileged domain operating in favor of those with significant resources, a plutocracy, if you will. Democracy organizes society to try to help people of everyday means deal with life. Plutocracy organizes society to help everyday people support the plutocracy. So when Thomas when Donald Trump rode into town, he found a waiting mob. I was going to go from here to follow the money into the heart of our crisis, but I'm not going to do that tonight. Let me just say that I've been looking at polls of the last six months all, from all over the world, and they show that every democracy is in trouble. And the director of data and polling for one very important survey said, right now, the biggest risk for democracies is that the public no longer sees them as democracies. And I want to close by urging you to read, if you haven't, an essay in the New York Review of Books, books recently by Christopher Browning, the historian. Did you see it? It's called The Suffocation of Democracy. And it's what prompted me to begin with my friend Jim Forbes' outcry, well, how do you answer when democracy says, I can't breathe? And here is what Christopher Browning says. Donald Trump doesn't need to be Hitler or the Republicans, Nazis, or America, the Weimar Republic. For democracy to disappear here, what we're seeing in the current wave of authoritarians is that the construction 
of overtly anti-democratic dictatorships aspiring to totalitarianism is unnecessary for holding power. Erdogan in Turkey, Putin in Russia, Duterte in the Philippines, and Viktor Orban in Hungary have all discovered that opposition parties can be left in existence and elections can be held in order to provide a fig leaf of democratic legitimacy, while in reality, elections pose scant challenge to their power. Total control of the press and other media is likewise unnecessary, since a flood of managed and fake news so pollutes the flow of information that facts and truth become irrelevant through selective purging and the appointment of politically reliable loyalists. Crony capitalism opens the way to a symbiosis of corruption and self-enrichment between political and business leaders. While not immigrant, while Explicitly anti-immigrant white nationalism, as well as the prioritization of law and order over individual rights, are also crucial in mobilizing the popular support of their bases and stigmatizing their enemies. This country, this democracy, cannot survive if only one party is committed to upholding democratic values. That, to me, is the message of the past. Thank you for your time. I think Billy wants a minute. Only just to say that, that uh, Bill Moyers is going to take some questions. Please make them brief so that as many people as possible can have a chance to hear more from Mr. Moyers. Thank you. Who's first? Yeah. Um, Thank I, you. I've been misquoting Santayana for years. I thought he said those who don't learn from history are condemned to relive it. What he said was those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Is remembering good enough or is learning the key to the whole thing? Well, there's an argument going on among historians as to whether uh, forgetting isn't what we should do with the past altogether. I don't share that uh, conviction, but there is that argument. Uh, it, no, it's more, it's, it's important not only to remember, to, but it's important to selectively forget. Uh, and it's important, I think, and what do I know? I just said I'm a journalist, not a historian or a psychologist or a scholar. It, it, it seems to me that some things we never want to forget. Some things can be forgotten. I, for, I had three fights in high school. I cannot remember the names of the three <laughs> kids three kids that uh, beat me up. Uh, I think one was Billy Bob and one was Ralph. I'm not sure. No, I think it was Billy Bob. But I've forgotten those. I don't want to have the, live with those grievances. What if I did? You know, I, but I want to remember that I got beaten up because I was small and uh, not strong. And I never got beat up after that. So there are some things to forget and some things to remember. We must never forget what men can do to each other, what human beings can do to each other. And we must try to remember the, to carve out and remember the lessons of the past that serve us today. I mean, for example, uh, I've been reading a, 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 another book about the Mayan civilization and how the very wealthy and privileged Mayans claimed the heights for their residency and for their headquarters. And 
and, and they claimed the first food and then ultimately the whole harvest and they claimed the water uh, when they knew a drought was coming and they thought they were going to be safe and uh, they died along with all the Mayans in the valley below. And I apply this to the Trump administration, which is composed of people who really don't care, it seems to me, that you could die for their profits and their power by doing nothing about global warming. So remembering the Mayans makes me think of Zink and uh, Scott Pruitt, Donald Trump and their sneering uh, hostility and denigration of science. So there are lessons to remember and there are stories to forget. Yes. Oh, we'll get you, I promise. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank you for a lifetime of education and ethics and values that you have given to us and our country and our world. But I'd like to ask you as a journalist, do you think that the media's focus on Trump and the other characters involved is almost complicit in what's happening in our country. I look at CNN and I don't see any other news. I look at ABC, you know, all the other networks, I don't see any other news. All I see is his name constantly being focused upon everything positive, everything negative, anything he says, any action he takes. And I think that it gives license to his poor behavior and our obsession with him and our lack of action as well, because the whole nation is just focused on almost minutia, as well as the, the picture that we don't see. We don't see what's happening when he passes a law, when he does something against the environment. It's, it's happened already. I, I agree with you. At first, I thought the relationship between the media and Trump, particularly the broadcast media, was symbiotic. I now think it's organic. That, as uh, Les Moombies, who was then head of CBS, said uh, every time Donald Trump, I'm paraphrasing, every time Donald Trump is on our screen, the ratings go up and the advertising rates follow, uh, bring it on, Donald. And it was a financial arrangement. I mean, the media really gave uh, Donald Trump the platform he needed. And the way they played the, the descent on the uh, escalator the day he announced was just playing right into his hands. Uh, you couldn't ignore him, obviously. He had a huge following and he was gaining and he was pre became president. But we, we did, be we, I say we, you know, Bill O'Reilly was in the media, I'm in the media. John Hannity's in the media. Uh, uh, Frank Bruni's in the media. I don't like the word media, but broadcast medium in, in particular has just fastened on Trump because he's usually good ratings. If the people started tuning him out, I can assure you they wouldn't spend time on him, too much time altogether on the tweet. I've never seen a president who can make the news the way he can just by uh, issuing an unreadable, indecipherable sentence. I really, I really <laughs> can't. And all during the, uh, what I thought was the crisis at, at uh, uh, the environmental agency with Scott Pruitt uh, destroying it, Re reversing auto automa automatically and arbitrarily regulations that affected children, pesticides, and affected climate warming. I just thought it was atrocious that you'd go night after night, morning after morning, to the network news, to the broadcast news, and not, uh, and, and, and not see anything about those stories. Again, although there was one or two mentions of global warming in the recent hurricane in Florida, uh, no network uh, gave more than five, 10, maybe 15 seconds uh, to saying, uh, discussing the connection between what is happening in the weather and global warming. We have been totally obsessed with what Donald Trump wants us to look at, and what he wants us to look at is him. Uh, and we have fallen into that trap. Thank you 
very much for everything. Um, my reaction to this uh, last election was to search out all the organizations that have been fighting the good fight for decades because they know how to do it and supporting them and getting on their email. And I have also been calling and, and working like the army of thousands of Americans working right now to get uh, progressives elected. But I would love if from your decades of experience of interviewing people who were creative, innovative, and inspiring, could you search out and mention one or a few whose work would serve as a role model in a parallel situation where suddenly the democracy that we took for granted turns out is in, in serious jeopardy? What, who, what would we do? I'm not quite sure I get the scope of the question. If what group would, could you support no. or? No, you have interviewed decades of right. amazing people who have, who have um, worked to transform horrendous oh, and which situations. One, which one or two I would recommend to who you? We, yes, yeah, who well, we could use as a role model in, in some way. I would start with Bill McKibben. Uh, the, the writer and naturalist who uh, became an activist, organized an, organiza organized an organization called 350.org uh, to fight global warming. And they had an enormous uh, response from around uh, the world. This was not just uh, signatures on an email. These were people who went out and really took to the field uh, to press the case for informing people about what was behind global warming and stopping the XL, the pipeline in the, in the Midwest. I mean, that's one of the most effective uh, grassroots organizations I've ever known. You may have seen uh, the Bill McKibben's uh, uh, column in the New York Times yesterday. He's been receiving death threats. Uh, and and he's, the headline was, can't we just stop, can we just agree not to say we're gonna kill each other? Uh, he's paid a real price uh, for it in terms of his security, his privacy, his safety. Uh, but he is still at work, he and his organization. Go to 350.org and uh, look at it. Uh, there's an organization, uh, Karen, what's the name of the Native American organization we've been working with up in the north, in the Midwest? Uh, what? Honor the Earth, a wonderful organization, honortheearth.org, yes, is an organization that is it's not just trying to preserve Native American culture, but are trying to fight the exploitation by big corporations of their land, their reservations, their resources. Very good uh, organization. There is a, 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 a lot of this. My favorite little known organization is called uh, Our Children's Trust. It's an organization, we did the only television about them for a long time, a group of young people in Oregon with uh, some adult lawyers who filed a suit against the local municipality for not exercising their trust uh, to preserve the environment for future generations. There's a doctrine in law that goes back to Rome that says governments have a responsibility to protect the resources which are necessary for life for those who are not participants in, 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 in society, not, not, uh, law, not uh, voters, not citizens, et cetera, for children especially. And these, organizations, this, these kids out in Portland got together with some lawyers there, pro bono lawyers, and a wonderful woman named Net Mary Wood, who is a professor of, of law, natural law, at the University of, of Portland, uh, University of Oregon. And they launched these suits against first uh, a municipality, then a county, and then the government of, of the state government of Oregon. Everybody thought they were gonna lose, but they won every case. The Obama administration, then they got to the federal court. The Obama administration opposed them. Federal judge said, let's hear the case. Then there comes the Trump administration Another federal judge approves their case, sends it on up the line, and they, uh, ju the, the higher judge says, let it go. So they were about to go to trial this next week, 
when finally the Supreme Court this last week, not surprisingly, issued a writ to hold it up again. This is an amazing story that the East Coast press has largely ignored, uh, largely ignored. Look it up when you go home, ourchildrenstrust.org. And they need money. They need pro bono legal work. Uh, they need citizens spreading the word about them because they're on to something, I think, that is inviolable. And, and many lawyers I've talked to do, too. There is validity in the, 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 the law of nature's trust that we have an obligation, governments have an obligation to make sure that this environment is not ruined for future generations. Otherwise, uh, the earth will be finished sooner than later. Yes. We yes. just have time for two more questions. Can we get one on this side and then that side? Or... All right. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your speech, first of all. Um, you talk about the biggest danger for democracy being demagogues and that demagogues need fertile ground. And can't hear, I can't sorry. hear you either. Uh, so he was talking about uh, democracy being endangered by demagogues and that uh, that obviously needs fertile ground. And you talked about the example of uh, Nazi Germany and the German population um, being in an existential crisis following the First World War. And it sounds like you referred back to the United States and the US democracy being in peril um, due to similar existential crises in parts of the population. But do you feel like this is sufficient to talk about endangering democracy, that there's grievances, that there's an existential crisis, there's uncertainty in parts of the population? Or do you feel like there's more to the dynamics in terms of polarization, in particular, on both parts of the political spectrum that is required for democracy to tremble? I think there's a genuine crisis of trust in democracy. As I said, so many people have given up on the deeper commitment to it because they don't think it has worked uh, for them. There's an organization called the Annual Democracy Index, published by The Economist, which shows democracy in trouble everywhere. These are the notes I uh, made by hand. Of the 167 countries ranked this year, 89 received lower scores on the Democracy Index than last year. There's a, something called the VDEM Project, the largest ever social science effort to measure democracy, published by the Washington Post in July, which found that since the end of 2017, one-third of the world's population, two and a half billion people, have lived through autocratization in which a leader or group of leaders begin uh, to limit democratic attributes and to rate more unilaterally. Only 15% only of the world's population today lives in countries where everyone, regardless of gender or socioeconomic status, has roughly equal access to political power. Yet another third report, the Democratic Perception Index, found that dem democracies worldwide are experiencing this crisis of trust. The majority of citizens in democratic nations do not believe that their voices matter in politics or that governments are acting in the public interest. Two research organizations found that those living in nations deemed democratic have even lost faith in government more than those living in a non-democratic state. More than half of the respondents uh, in democ Democrats, democracy said their votes rarely or never matter in politics. And 64% said they believe the government rarely or never acts in the public interest. Now, you know, what I should have said more explicitly and would have if I hadn't lost that minute, <laughs> what, what, what I should have said is that democracy was in real trouble before Trump came along. I mean, turnout was low. Uh, uh, there were protests. Uh, the expenditures were out of control. The government was dysfunctional. Uh, poverty was increasing. Uh, unemployment was increasing. Uh, our government had moved a long way from the days of the New Deal, which believed that government has a responsibility to help uh, people. And that was the widespread disaffection uh, combined with 
racism. Ben Fountain, the author of this book, I highly recommend to you. If you read it, you get the best uh, sense of where we are today. Ben, ben Fountain said he traveled in do, traveling that campaign in 2016 had never met so many disaffected uh, working and middle class people, had never met so many white people who were angry uh, after uh, were angry when Obama was elected. They, they, he was the symbol of what they have felt for a long time. They are losing their supremacy. Uh, and he said it was just um, that somebody was going to strike a match to that kin, kin, uh, kindling, and it turned out to be Trump. Uh, and we were, you know, Americans had the delusional had come in from the margin and was occupying the centrality of American life. We're deluding ourselves that global warming is going away. We were deluding ourselves that you can uh, continue to engineer structured discrimination and not have uh, this generation of uh, young black and Latino men and women uh, finally move beyond. They expected great things in the Obama era, didn't get them. Uh, and now they were disaffected and discontented. And I, democracy was in real trouble. I used to do edit shows about this before I ever thought that Donald Trump would run for president. He just came along at, at, the, at, at, the, uh, at, at the right moment. And the reason I, I talked about Hitler so much is that he, was, he had all the attributes, many of the attributes, sorry, not all of them, but many of the attributes of Donald Trump, charismatic, uh, 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 determined, uh, had a common touch, uh, and, and Bill, Ben Fountain in this book says he's never seen audiences so enthralled as he saw in Des Moines and, uh, and uh, Madison and other places when, when Trump spoke. He, 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 he was speaking their language, and he didn't have to keep it hidden. None of what Trump believes was hidden. Uh, and, and, uh, the, and so he, ex he came into town, as I said, and they were waiting for Superman. Well, you know, seven years ago, I still have it. I still have the front page of the New York Post, Karen, in my office on my bulletin board, and it had a picture of Superman uh, and, and, and cape and an S, and it says, waiting for Superman. And I said, didn't I, that, you know, this country is, wants someone like that, someone who's going to be uh, a Superman, not just charismatic and handsome and, and sexy, but somebody who was really going to promise to do things that a dysfunctional deadlock government couldn't accomplish. And here he comes. And I, I, I've actually been relieved not to have been a practicing uh, uh, working journalist the last three years. I know that's an oxymoron now, but, but, uh, but I didn't have, I don't have the vocabulary to explain what has happened. This alien force that has entered the bloodstream of American politics. I mean, we've had lying presidents, uh, dumb presidents, uh, lazy presidents, uh, stupid presidents, uh, out of touch presidents, all of our, we've had a, they've been flawed. Man, we've never had a president as mean and as ugly and as cruel as this president. And, and how that can appeal to people, I'd have to be them to, un to try to understand it. I haven't been able to explain to people as w uh, about politics the way Neil deGrasse Tyson can explain space uh, or, or, or the universe. And it's been frustrating because I, pardon? Yes? Well, I'm I think we, we have to stop and, and I, I think you undersell Thank you. And thank you. I welcome everybody to continue the conversation over reception in the Great Hall.